Hi, everyone, and welcome to the in-depth workshop, uh, in-depth in interview workshop, excuse me, conducted by Margaret Roller. I'm Sue Boffman from ARL, and very pleased to welcome project team members from the Research Library Impact Framework Initiative and colleagues from our project libraries. It's really great to have you join us today. Uh, with a quick introduction, I'd like to share uh, just a little bit about the Research Library Impact Framework. Uh, this is a grant initiative that has been underway for well over a year, and our project teams have been very busy exploring a series of five questions. Um, these questions relate to space, diversity, equity, and inclusion, special collections, and researcher productivity. Uh, so our teams have been exploring these questions uh, and using a variety of methods to do that. Our overarching goal of this initiative is to help us understand how to address some of the most pressing questions that you deal with in your libraries with regards to value and impact. And this initiative is funded by the IMLS grant for which we're very appreciative. So as part of this initiative, our two consultants, Margaret Roller and Kevin Famelant, have developed a series of workshops on qualitative and quantitative research methods. Our goal for the workshop series is to help our library staff develop their skills and expertise in conducting research at your libraries. Uh, the in-depth interview workshop is part of this series and Margaret will be offering it again on Thursdays the 18th. Uh, so again, happy that you're here with us. Uh, the sessions are being recorded and we will share the recording slides and any other documentation with everyone. And you are very welcome to share the materials with your colleagues who couldn't be with us today if they were hoping to join us. Um, so with that, Margaret, let me turn the podium, our virtual podium, over to you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, great. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for that introduction. And welcome, everybody. I, um, I'm, I'm going to, I don't know how many of you are at the focus group workshop we did um, last month. Um, uh, so, so I'm going to repeat myself here uh, it, it, to say that I have a lot of content here. I know I have a lot of content and I've done that deliberately um, because you will have this slide deck and the recording, of course, at the end of all of this. And I wanted you to have this information. And if there is anything we need to follow up on, if there's further questions or things we need to get into, fine, let, let's do that. Um, but I wanted, but again, I wanted to keep the content I have in there so that that you would have it something for you to think about and again something for, for us to follow up on if we need to um the very broadly here are the four areas i'm going to cover uh, uh today uh just a broad view of qualitative research this is again of course a repeat of focus this is actually talking about qualitative research uh, up front is a repeat <laughs> Of, of every every discussion and talk I give about qualitative research, because it's really important for you to understand um, what I am talking about when I talk about qualitative research. So it's within that context that you can think about some of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, talk very broadly about the in-depth in -depth interview method, and then, then do more of a deep dive into the quality considerations and best practices, skills and techniques, and then those three areas are going to help provide, uh, I think, important context to the final item there, which is a discussion of the modes, uh, including the online modes. So what is qualitative research? Uh, again, uh, I, I, this is, again, going to be a repeat for, for many of you that were at the focus group um, workshop last month. But important for, your, for all of you to understand that when I'm talking about qualitative research, I'm really talking about a, a, uh, a set of methods that have very unique qualities, uh, very different than survey research. Uh, qualitative research is about going beyond the obvious and the expedient, and very much so uh, focusing on context and the interconnections of human thought and behavior. And which is another way of saying that uh, a qualitative researcher understands that you know, the, the, the answer to any single question really rests uh, and is related to a whole bunch of other questions that adds meaning. 
Here are 10 unique attributes of qualitative research. You'll see on the right side, I've highlighted four of them because I believe that these four really uh, serve to provide um, much of what is unique about qualitative research, although all 10 of these are unique, but it's the, again, context, the importance of meaning, and what we'll talk a lot about today, the participant researcher relationship and the researcher as in instrument are really fundamental, fundamental and fundamentally unique to qualitative research. So the, the in-depth interview method, uh, I, I, I would assume we all know what that means, but what I want to highlight here is the importance of what really singles out the in-depth interview method from all other methods. And that's the interviewer interviewee relationship, which is at the heart of the method. It makes in essence, the in-depth interview method, the most personal of all qualitative methods. And we'll talk a lot about that today. And actually it is going to be kind of the foundation by which, uh, from which we talk about all other aspects of the method that we're gonna talk about today. There are three types, basic types of interviews, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. I have highlighted semi-structured simply because that is the most common um, interview type that is used, which is not to say that not so much structured because then we get a little bit more into survey research, but of course, unstructured is used, particularly in narrative research. Um, but semi-structured in-depth interviews is, is uh, probably the most common and is probably what I am thinking of the most as I go about um, with my comments today. So why conduct in-depth uh, interviews, which I will call IDIs uh, for most of the rest of the discussion today. Focus group discussions, as I talked about in the earlier workshop, focus group discussions are really better at getting, are definitely better at getting, um, at uh, focusing on dynamic conversation and understanding how people debate issues, maybe looking at how people's attitudes shift during discussion, which is really kind of an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it can also be a very supportive environment. But the in-depth interview method, which by the way, is the more popular method of, of the two, more people, more qualitative researchers are conducting IDIs than they are focus groups for the, mo for the most part. That's a very broad statement. Um, but the in-depth interview method provides very granular contextual type of, of data and information. It can reduce response bias. And here I'm thinking of something like social desirability, which is a bias that can enter in, um, come in particularly uh, in the focus group method uh, and flexibility. And we'll get into that later on in our discussion today about the flexibility of the IDI method when it comes to mode. Um, more specifically, the strengths of um, the in-depth interview method are and right at the top, the interviewer interviewee relationship. It, as I've already alluded to, it can, re it can reduce um, bias, you know, again, satisfying or social desirability bias. Um, non it can reduce non-response, meaning people just not responding to our questions and it can increase validity, particularly question and answer validity. It's, it's a, once again, um, a wonderful and, and effective way at understanding complex issues because of the contextual nature of in-depth interviews and its ability to leave the researcher with um, a story, a, a very kind of rich, nuanced story to tell. It can be a very uh, supportive environment, uh, the one-on-one -on -one environment, which can strengthen data quality uh, when it comes to any sensitive topics or, or certain uh, segments of the population and things of that nature. And, and as I put on the, the, the last um, item on this slide, uh, reaching um, hard to reach or vulnerable populations, uh, such as disabilities, people with disabilities and things of that nature. Limitations. Now, limitations right at the top of the list is the same thing as at the top of the list of the strengths, right? The, it, which is um, the interviewer-interviewee um, relationship, uh, which can be a limitation because there can be interviewer effects that might 
uh, uh, appear because of personal characteristics or the values or beliefs that the interviewer brings to the interview. And the social context or what Kabbalah called the power dynamics uh, involved in the one-on-one -on -one, uh, in-depth interview where um, it may turn out to be more of a one-way di dialogue where the interviewer is actually ruling the interview. So, so that can be clearly a limitation and a problem with in-depth interviews. And it's through the, the skills and techniques of the interviewer, which are critical to overcome some of these interviewer effects in the social context problems and to mitigate uh, potential bias and inconsistency uh, in, um, in, uh, within and across interviews. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Let's go on and talk about quality and qualitative research. And I, just as I did in the last workshop, I'm going to draw on um, the, the uh, total quality framework, which is a framework discussed in the book Paul Bacchus and I um, published back in 2015. And it's, it's based on kind of this idea that you see in front of you here, which is, you know, if if qualitative research can serve worthwhile purposes, then logically it would serve those purposes only to the degree that it's done well. And so we propose something called the total quality framework, consists of four components that you can see on the screen there. The first component is credibility, and that has to do with um, data collection. And that's just the one I'm gonna focus on right now to talk about quality and in-depth interviews. So credibility, that first component of the total quality framework has kind of two areas or components. One is scope and scope has to do with coverage and sample design. So in coverage, we're looking at a lot of the same things we look at in survey research. We're looking at the representativeness of participants to the population working with complete and accurate lists. So if you're working with, let's say, lists of faculty members or students or things of that nature, and sample design. We usually um, uh, work with purposive sampling rather than convenience or snowball sampling, if we can get away with it. Um, and if we have lists that we can stratify, we stratify them and we um, randomly so select across lists. Um, this um, whole area of sample design uh, includes the question of how many interviews do I conduct? Now, uh, I, I, I've read enough in the literature, including the literature written by uh, library researchers, that there is some feeling out there that there is a magical number to how many interviews you should conduct. And, um, Often the number revolves around six. If you do six interviews, you're good to go. Uh, if you conduct 12, then uh, you reach this thing called saturation and that's a whole nother topic. But all of which is to say that there is no magic number because you want to evaluate the number of interviews to conduct at least in two stages of the process. At the design stage, uh, and at which point you'll be thinking about and looking at the diversity of your population. You'll be looking at the breadth and depth of the topic and issues. So for instance, if you want to conduct interviews uh, where the key research question or objective had to do with understanding specific terminology or let's say reactions to a new service idea, you're going to, those those interviews may be a little bit longer than, than they would otherwise, because you are going, you, the interviewer, are going to be spending um, a very uh, concerted time uh, investigating that terminology or that concept, which is going to add uh, into the overall time of your interview. And you're gonna to need to do that the same way for, for interview to interview. So it's going to, to add in a little bit to um, how many interviews you need to do. Uh, the expected variation of results and of course, scheduling resources is always an issue. But the other time to think about how many interviews you're gonna conduct is during, at the field stage, when you're actually out there conducting interviews. Uh, and you, when you're, when you're in the field stage, you're going to be reflecting on these kinds of questions you see in front of you now. 
uh, did did all interviewees provide clear, unambiguous answers? Do I understand what all the interviewees said back to me in response to my questions? Um, are new ideas and themes um, emerging or or are popping up in these interviews as I go along? And so, therefore, should I keep on going in order to to understand if there are more ideas that I haven't untapped and to help enrich the ones I have untapped. Um, do the um, data I've obtained tell a story so far? Uh, is, do I have a story I can, do I think I have a story that I can uh, come back with uh, just based on the interviews I've done? So it's, so m the point being is that uh, for, for me or anyone to say, you need to conduct six interviews um, is, really kind of missing the point of what you really need to be looking at when you think about how many interviews to conduct. The other area within scope is a whole area of what we call non-response, which is basically having to do with gaining access. Because why? Because the question is, as always is, um, are the participants who show up for your research, for your in-depth interviews, the same or different than ones that don't? And that's kind of an important question. So. Uh, gaining cooperation, and there's a lot of different ways you can try to gain cooperation. I've highlighted on this list flexibility of mode, which I have, I touched on just briefly earlier. This is unique to in-depth interviews, unlike uh, focus group discussions. Um, the in-depth interview offers uh, the researcher the opportunity to um, to venture into a variety of different modes to conduct interviews. And I would also um, uh, add to that a variety of locations. I can't tell you the kinds of locations. I, when I conduct in-depth interviews, uh, I, I almost always, if not always, allow the participant to tell me where we are going to meet for in-person interview. And um, simply, for this reason, to gain cooperation and make sure they show up and make sure we have an interview, which has meant that you know I've conducted interviews on the back of pickup trucks and all kinds of various places, um, which may be inconvenient for me, but it's great in actually getting interviews done. Now, part of the cooperation of, of gaining cooperation also means uh, having effective confirmations. And I'm not gonna go through what you see on the screen right now, except to say, that when you are at this stage, the confirmation stage, it's very important for uh, um, you and whoever you're working with to have kind of a, a process, a protocol in place of how those confirmations are going to happen and what you're going to do when these various situations occur. So for instance, the last item on that screen is, you know, what happens when confirmation is judged weak? Well, what is a weak confirmation? A weak confirmation may be somebody who says, oh, right, Friday at two o'clock. Well, let me see. I don't think I have anything else going on then. That's not, that's not a strong confirmation. That's a weak confirmation. And so you need to, to know how you're going to deal with those kinds of things um, when they come up. Okay, so the other area of credibility component of the TQF and the total quality frame is data gathering. And this has everything to do with validity. In other words, are we measuring what we think we are measuring in the in-depth interview? And it boils down to looking at how we are, how we are obtaining the content, uh, researcher effects, again, bias and inconsistency of the researcher, and the participants' willingness and ability to pro provide us information, all of which affects the validity of our data. So one, as I just said, is content, how we obtain, um, how we obtain the information. And I talked about this in the, for the focus group, in the focus group workshop, and indeed for, the, uh, for IDIs, for the in-depth interview method, uh, we also need to be thinking very carefully about the guide development, the overall flow, the topics and issues, main questions, probing questions, and remi remembering, very important to remember, this is not a script. It is a guide, and it has a funnel approach where we go from broad to narrow. We start with introductions, general information, 
which is going to provide us what? The context by which we will explore stages three and four. And of course, four, stage four is where we get to what we really wanna know. The, you know, stage four is where we're getting to our real objective and, and key research question. But to get there, we have to go through these earlier stages so, so that we have the context. I'm providing here one example of an IDI, something that I've worked on, one of my studies, an IDI study for GuideStar. I conducted 86 uh, in-depth interviews for GuideStar. GuideStar is the world's largest provider of nonprofit information. And they asked me to conduct in-depth interviews with both users and non-users of their information to understand their needs as it relates to nonprofit information uh, and to come back with what they needed to know to help develop new products and service concepts. Um, so I conducted 86 in-person and telephone in-depth interviews with uh, corporate giving uh, decision makers, uh, government entities, foundations, public charities, and all kinds of uh, folks who were using nonprofit information. We began with, in, uh, after introductions on stage two, I, I gathered just some, some, some basic knowledge of how um, and what they are using for um, in the way to, to gather, to, to gain nonprofit data and information. Uh, along with that, uh, I gained their um, awareness and use and comparison of the existing uh, nonprofit providers, their existing nonprofit providers. And then in stage three, knowing all of that, in stage three, I could start focusing on GuideStar, which of course, in almost all cases came up in stage two because GuideStar is so prominent. But in stage three is when I really focused on GuideStar, their awareness and perception of GuideStar, their, its strengths and weaknesses compared to other providers and things of that nature. And then in stage four, I got to what I really wanted to talk about, which is how to improve GuideStar to assist in their um, future information needs. And I asked them to paint me kind of a portrait of the ideal provider and then asked me, asked them to tell me how GuideStar fit or didn't fit with their sense of ideal. Okay, so the, um, the other um, aspect um, that can influence the validity of our data and potentially weaken the validity of our data in depth interviews is interviewer bias. And that is because um, the, among other things, the interviewer may bias the data by um, not maintaining objectivity during the interview, by losing track of the conversation uh, and not identifying inconsistencies when, in other words, when participants contradict each other in different uh, points in time in the interview, um, the interviewer needs to pick up on that and question that because those kinds of um, inconsistencies or contradictions are just chock full of useful information that's going to help the interviewer understand what's really going on with that participant and their physical appearance um, in face-to-face -face mode. As I state here and I say it in the last workshop, the reflexive journal can be a wonderful way to identify interviewer bias. And that's simply a diary that the interviewer can go back to um, by way of the audio recording, maybe the video recording, and uh, ask themselves, you know, what do I think I know from this participant? And, and um, it, it is ideally good to do this like right after the interview uh, to, to ask themselves, what do I think I know? What assumptions do I, uh, did I make? Um, how do I think I know what I think I know? <laughs> and, and I think probably uh, most importantly, how did my personal values and beliefs impact what, what went on in that interview, questions I asked and things of that nature. So very important to kind of get at um, any uh, possible bias that's going on with the interviewer. Now, the, another, the other area is inconsistency, again, which I've mentioned a few times now already. And what I mean by inconsistency is 
or as an example, is maybe when uh, the interviewer, for whatever reason, uh, does not cover the guide fully uh, across all interviews, or the interviewer is uh, going back to something I talked about earlier about maybe a key objective of this research is to understand um, uh, reactions to a particular concept. Um, let's say a new um, on-site library service or a new functionality on your website or something of that nature. It's very important that the, the interviewer um, um, talks about that and introduces that to the participant in a consistent way from interview to interview. If the interviewer doesn't follow up on really key topic areas, across all interviews, that's inconsistent and potentially a problem. And that last point you see on the slide, where I say the interview guide is not scaled appropriately, unlike, this is unlike focus group discussions, because um, it's not unusual at all for IDIs to be conducted both in person and on the phone. And that's fine. And as I've already told you, I've, I've I've done that a lot. But what's important here is that the interviewer, the researcher scale the guide appropriately because you are not going to be able to have, you, you have to go into the phone interview assuming you're not going to have the uh, time um, uh, that you had in the in-person in interview. And so you're going to have to think very carefully what you need to scale back and your priorities and things of that nature. So to mitigate these um, potential problems with validity having to do with interviewer bias uh, and inconsistency, we need to think about interviewer skills. And here are four interviewer skills uh, in front of you. And we're gonna just touch now on the first three. For building rapport, as I mentioned earlier, um, the in-depth interview method is one of the most personal, if not the most personal form of qualitative research. So building rapport in a trusting relationship is really key to the success of an interview. It's important because it's by way of that rapport that participants are willing and able to share their candid thoughts. And I would suggest to you that that includes the participant's comfort in saying to you, the interviewer, I don't know. Um, it, that is uh, just as critical as anything else that the, uh, that the interviewer, uh, the participant be comfortable in saying to the interviewer, you know, I just don't know the answer to that question rather than making something up. It moves you, so this willingness moves you closer to your objectives, which in the end provides you with quality data and useful outcomes. Building rapport begins before the interview. So it means it, it begins when you contact the participant prior to the interview um, to, uh, to discuss and communicate the purpose of the study, the basic content that's going to be covered, the length, the incentive is if there is one, um, and hopefully there is, and participants' questions. But it's also important, of course, during the interview, and that's what most people think of when they think of building rapport during the interview. And one way is actively listening. Actively listening is, is being genuinely interested uh, with whatever the participant has to say. As Carl Rogers said, it's about unconditional positive regard, which is full acceptance and support, irrespective of what the participant says. Actively listening means, uh, uh, means uh, uh, actively listening when it's verbal or textual listening, if the, and we'll get into modes in a minute when, when the mode is uh, text-based, um, as well as nonverbal or quiet listening, uh, which again is true really across all modes. So everything I'm talking about here is really not mode specific uh, and really true of all modes that we can actively listen. 
It also means that during the interview that you're picking up on participants' cues, they kind of go what I, hand in hand with what I just said. But here the focus is on the participants' cues that the participant is giving you the interviewer. In terms of any verbal or textual cues, cons again, consistencies, inconsistencies, particular words, particular repetition of words, as well as nonverbal or what I call quiet um, cues in terms of facial expressions, eye, can eye contact, things of that nature. For the in-person mode, you know, just the seating and the seating distance from between you and the participant um, sometimes can be a little clue um, that, uh, that the interviewer needs to pick up on and potentially um, use um, to the advantage of building building rapport. So the fourth kind of really be broad key interviewer skills is staying focused. And this is not unlike um, uh, focus group discussions where you consistently probe, keeping in mind always what um, the, uh, the most important research objectives are to your in-depth interview research. Being able to identify and assess the relevance of unanticipated products topics is probably, I think, one of the more important and one of the more um, uh, um, area that interviewers need skill on. I think sometimes that skill is maybe sometimes missing in training. But this is very important that the interviewer is able, the interviewer understands the objectives of the research so well that um, that the interviewer can assess uh, what uh, is being said in the interview as it relates to the objectives and whether or not this is something that they need to um, uh, learn more about, even though it's nowhere on the guide. Question wording should not vary, and I've talked, I've already mentioned that a few times, and being able to manage time, which is always um, a big consideration in qualitative research is managing time. Now, here is uh, an area, a skill that is not, is unique to in-depth interviews, uh, was not discussed in focus group, in the focus group method. And that is because the, and, and the quote you see there on the screen is taken from an article I wrote and put on my blog devoted to note-taking in, in the in-depth interview method. It's very important what, and, and, and I say handwritten notes, I'm not talking about using your laptop or any other such thing, but handwritten notes as you are, and I would say particularly in the in-person interview, online and all, it becomes more difficult, but in person, um, particularly for the in-person interview, um, taking handwritten notes as you are talking to the uh, participant, the interviewee, helps you, the interview, fully engage with that participant and helps you become very reflective of what is uh, going on in that interview. And um, in the end, of course, maintains this all important participant researcher relationship that is again, kind of the foundation of, of the in-depth interview method. Uh, I, I, I think I can't, stress enough, there are some people that that want to talk about this idea, may not agree with it, but I think once we have that discussion, they usually kind of see what I'm getting at here, that that handwritten note taking for in-person interviews is very, very important. And it really transforms the, the interviewer. I will go so far to say, I think the interviewer comes out of that interview more knowledgeable about what actually went on in that interview and what was learned in that interview than, than someone who has, has not. That's a pretty big statement, but I think that's true. <laughs> I do think that's true. Okay, in addition to those core skills, um, we have to have effective ways to ask questions. Again, this was covered in the, the focus group workshop, but let me just go um, through this uh, pretty briefly. Uh, Again, this is something that does not vary across modes. This is not a mode thing. Uh, this is true of really all in, in depth interviews. The three kind of very kind of in, in, the, in the simplest 
form, the three basic uh, types of questions are the context, the comparison, contrast, and clarification. The examples you see here for each of these types uh, came, were adapted from a study I found in the literature um, by a library researcher who was conducting, um, who conducted in-depth interviews with dance faculty and um, and shared the guide and and what you see here are some again some adaptations of what I saw from the guide. So context is there to help kind of ground us in and um, and 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 help us the interviewer um, probe effectively moving on in the interview because it gives us the context and the grounding that we need. The comparison contrast is, is really an important uh, type of question because to not ask a comparison contrast type question, questions um, would leave the interviewer with a misunderstanding that all issues are, are equal. So in this case, I've used the very simple idea of how would you compare the information you gain from printed books from that um, with that from ebooks. The clarification question is kind of central to why we conduct qualitative research in the first place, right? Which is explanation. Again, to not ask participants to clarify themselves or clarify something they've talked about is really missing the, an opportunity and missing the whole point of conducting qualitative research. The example I use here is, you stated that you consult magazines and journal articles in electronic format, but prefer printed books. What makes one format better than another for certain sources of information? So all of these are, are very basic but important types of questions to ask. Now, <laughs> by the way, we all ask the why question. Again, this is something else I, co I covered in the focus group workshop, but let me just uh, repeat this briefly. We all ask the why question. I ask the why question, but my whole point here is to strongly suggest that when you're sitting down to write the why question that you think very, very carefully about that and, um, and, and maybe even think about maybe another way to ask Instead of asking why, ask how so, in what way, tell me about a time, um, give me an example, what are you thinking of, you know, things of that nature. And the reason is, is that what you see in front of you are just four reasons that uh, I question the why question. One is rationality. Uh, in essence, we're asking participants to explain themselves. To, and what I say, I use the word justify, which is more appropriate to justify themselves. And in the process of that, uh, we're stifling the conversation. In the process of that, they're trying to say, okay, well, you know, how am I going to justify this to the interviewer, which has effectively kind of stopped the flow of conversation. It can also, I propose to you that it also clouds meaning. And I use the example here of, you know, the question, why is a library important to your research? I would suggest is a pretty difficult and confusing uh, question. Um, you know, that's like asking somebody, why are you happy? I, it, it's just a very confusing kind of, kind of question. But asking what are the specific aspects of the library that make it important to your research well, that's something that's much more answerable. I can get my head around that and, and give you an answer to that. I also think that there are many times when that why question is actually asking a question you hadn't intended to ask. And I use the example here of why do you use Google Scholar? And I'm suggesting that that's a very different question than maybe what you really wanted to ask. What you really want to ask is, what are the benefits you derive from using Google Scholar compared to other databases? That's all. So in, in addition to direct questions, there are indirect questions and we can use enabling techniques to um, modify direct questions. I cannot tell you how many times, many, many times, uh, I have been conducting uh, interviews or group discussions 
and have asked a question and gotten blank stares back at me uh, for whatever reason, participant couldn't answer. But as soon as I put a sentence, put a sentence completion, and I use the example, the examples here again come from the dance faculty study I mentioned to you a minute ago. Um, I have found that the most effective way to manage the information I obtain is to, and all of a sudden, the participant can answer. I don't understand all the psychology of that, but it's, I just know it's true because it's happened so many times. There's word association and storytelling. You know, tell me a story about a time when, that kind of thing. And just like focus group discussions, there are participant types um, in, in the IDI method. And I list a few of them here. Uh, there may be more. These are um, the ones that I am all too familiar with. I would just suggest to you, and, and there's ways to, we're not going to go into it today. There are ways to deal with these situations. Um, uh, I would also just mention that at, towards the bottom, I have fast talker, and I would just suggest to you that the fast talker is not necessarily the same person who wants to rush through the interview, which is the last item on that on the screen. And by the way, the person who wants to rush through the interview is, is more often than not uh, someone I'm interviewing on the phone. Um, and that's, it goes back to why what? Why we adapt the guide uh, for the phone when we've been conducting in-person interviews. That's one reason because we're invariably going to get somebody who says, I gotta go, I gotta go. How many more questions do you have? That kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to go on to uh, modes. Um, what you see here is kind of a, a broad, uh, graphic of synchronous and asynchronous modes. If nothing else, all of this is to say to you what I've already said, which is what, that the IDI method really lends itself to a, a lot of different modes, uh, definitely more modes than we have in the focus group discussion method. You'll see here, by the way, that I have mobile, the mobile mode, both in synchronous and asynchronous. And indeed, that's because we can conduct uh, mobile, let's say, in the moment research um, on in a, synchronously when when they are actually um, uh, reporting to us and we are talking to them real time about what it is they are experiencing. But you can also do that uh, almost in a, in a diary fashion in an asynchronous mode. So traditional modes, in-person and phone, there, and you probably already know this, but there are a number of strengths to uh, both of these modes. In-person is obviously a, uh, more in line with a natural um, conversation. It facilitates uh, building rapport. You're able to recognize um, and react to cues. And it can be a more complete and in-depth interview, which goes back to what I just said a minute ago about the phone and someone, someone on the phone wanting to rush through the interview. The phone, on the other hand, uh, is a good mode in, in the sense that in terms of scope, you can get a wider coverage. You don't have trips around the US doing in-depth interviews, which I've done. Uh, it can um, uh, help in gaining cooperation because it can be more convenient for participants. And it can uh, mitigate bias if, uh, again, uh, the various visual cues are going to cause possible, bi possible bias. The limitations of these modes are kind of a, a flip-flop of each other. Uh, the in-person limitation of in-person, obviously, is the, the scope, cooperation, and potential bias, inter interviewer bias, and participant effects. The phone weakened rapport. I've already alluded to that. Um, the absence of cues and the uh, potentially less in depth and shorter interview, which I've also alluded to. So what about the online modes? Uh, I've, I've broken out three here, the online uh, video mobile and the email. Now the email slash what's called discussion board 
uh, discussion boards are basically um, qualitative research platforms that can be used for focus group discussions, which I talked about last time, uh, or in-depth interviews. So, um, so each of these types of modes are particularly good for the uh, various um, uh, types of research that you see there. Those are just those are merely examples. Obviously, there's there's more to it, but but they are particularly good for uh, uh, obviously online video to substitute for in person usability uh, research uh, to understand, you know, how someone uses something. Uh, concurrent mixed methods, in other words, uh, using, combining um, uh, survey and qualitative research when they're, they are being conducted concurrently. The mobile research, in-moment research, uh, mobile uh, mode um, for in-the-moment research, which I'm going to talk more about in a minute. And uh, the email and discussion board uh, mode, which can be very good for sensitive topics for, um, for again, people, uh, researchers who have been conducted IDIs with uh, people with disabilities have used the email mode. Um, uh, it's good for professionals and things of that nature. So as just a kind of a blanket broad statement across all these online modes, uh, the, the key strengths lie in the representation and cooperation, you know, coverage, convenience, be, may be more relevant um, for, um, uh, and just more appropriate for certain types of the population. And the data accuracy and the depth, uh, again, because you can, uh, in these online modes, it's not just audio, it's not just visual, it's not, it's just a real combination of what you can gather in terms of the data, which I'll show in a minute can also be a problem because <laughs> it's just too much data. Um, but it, so it allows for a lot of detail and it can mitigate recall error, recall error in the asynchronous mode. Now, you'll notice at the bottom here, I say it may be efficient use of resource. Um, let me just say it may, it may not. And I use the word may because uh, you will need to determine for yourself whether or not uh, you're saving money simply because there are costs involved uh, in using the online platforms. And uh, depending on what you're doing, the, the costs may or may not be um, uh, um, better than doing it in, in a more traditional way. So you just need to be careful about that. Limitations, again, broad statement on the limitations of these online modes. Um, and as we discussed last time in the last workshop, there is uh, cues that may be missing, you know, even in the video mode, uh, picking up cues can be difficult. Uh, and certainly not like when you're in person, so they may be missing. Analysis, as I just alluded to, there's lots and lots of data potentially uh, that you need to um, take into account, uh, particularly in terms of your time and energy going um, when, when, it's, when your interviewing is done, you're going to need to give yourself a lot of um, a lot of space and a lot of time in order to do the analysis. Fraud and security, of course, is always a consideration to keep in mind. There always can be technical glitches, of course, and for text-based, like such as mobile and the email mode can be a limitation. I talked earlier um, about the total quality framework and the, and the credibility component of the TQF and the two aspects of credibility, which is scope and data gathering. What I'm providing here is simply a graphic to give you an, an idea of what I've already talked about, which is the, the, the green boxes here have uh, depict um, strength uh, of the quality of the data and the red boxes um, is a, a, a limitation or weakness. And um, you, can, you can see here that among other things, uh, the validity, this is for online video, that the validity uh, can be weakened um, in terms of the ability to establish rapport. And you will notice that that is 
true for the other online modes as well. Here's the mobile mode. And again, a weakened ability to establish rapport. Also notice that I have over on the right side of that screen under participant effects, um, I, I, I mentioned in the red boxes, something that I call, I'm calling selection bias and altered behavior. And what I mean by that is that, and, and you're gonna see this in a minute, but what I mean by that is that if we ask a participant, for instance, to uh, conduct an interview with us in the moment that they're doing something so that we can see and talk to them as they are going through a process, let's say. We, the interviewer researcher, need to keep in mind that, that there may be some selection bias going on here, the, uh, not necessarily consciously, but the participant may be selecting what to show or not to show us, for instance. Um, the participant may be altering uh, behavior in some way. Again, not necessarily consciously, but it can happen. And so the same kind of thing for the email discussion board mode. Again, in terms of validity, uh, a weakened ability to um, establish uh, rapport um, over on the participant and effects side, as I've mentioned earlier or alluded to anyway, this idea of low text skills, um, which can come in many different shapes and forms. So anyway, that just kind of gives you, a, again, a graphic, a visual to, to think about, to look at and to think about um, as it relates to these online modes within the, um, within the realm of the framework, the credibility component of the framework. There are many uh, qualitative dedicated platforms. These are platforms that are very, are specific to conducting qualitative research. Uh, here are just some of them. Uh, they offer a variety of, of, of features and, and things that the interviewer can do to help engage participants. This is from 2020 research. I did an EPA study. This is um, just one example of, of a markup where the participant can go in and as you're talking to the participant, uh, markup, something that you're showing. This is also a, a markup tool. This one's from Focus Vision. They offer heat maps. Uh, they offer observed chat. This is from iTrax. Uh, they offer a number of different features. They also allow you to um, uh, engage a participant with collages and mind maps and visual elicitation and, and things of that nature. Also, what these online platforms do, these qualitative research dedicated platforms do, is they provide full text support, um, uh, automatic transcripts, edible video, machine translations. They have, um, I don't, most or all have panels that they will do the recruiting from. Uh, so they're really multi dimensional. I guess is what I'm trying to, my points I'm trying to make. Here is um, screenshots from Indemo, which is another provider and specific to their mobile platform. And, uh, it, and here is an example of the in the moment research um, where they have, in this case, they have they're, they have, as you can see, they're asking participants to answer questions as they actually do something. And again, it helps kind of understand what the participant is thinking and doing in the moment that they are thinking or doing it. So it's obviously mitigating recall. So all, so this, and the last thing I'm going to, to mention is the idea of mobile diaries. This, what you're seeing here from Indemo, is this is something that can be done, this in the moment research can be something that is done, uh, an, an interview that is conducted synchronously, real time, or it can be asynchronous. So I might ask the participant to actually engage in some kind of activity, whatever it is, over time, 
and then uh, kind of report back to me in the in the form of a diary. Mobile diaries are something that is something that has kind of been spearheaded by marketing researchers. They have kind of used the mobile diary um, approach to uh, to get at what they call consumer journeys, uh, such as understanding, for example, the online to offline purchase experience. It allows them to to get at participants' thoughts and feelings and behavior at the moment that they are happening. And I'm just going out on a limb here. Now, maybe this is something you folks already do, um, but uh, this may be something that may could be useful to library assessment. Uh, again, going on a limb, I don't know if it is or not, but it just got me thinking that it could be useful, for instance, to understand how users um, are using library resources and understanding kind of the before, during, and after experience. The strengths of a mobile library, um, a mobile diary approach, is the, is the fact that you can, participants, you, you are kind of, you're, you're gathering information from participants from multiple locations, uh, doing multiple activities over various time periods. It can be a good way at getting at kind of these, the secret life of participants in a way, kind of these hidden aspects of participants that you might not get to. Otherwise, then they might not talk freely about in just a single shot interview. Uh, the limitation is, limitations are really boiled down to what I've already mentioned, is that it has the potential of disturbing disrupting their natural behavior and experiences. And again, it's the participant, not you, who is controlling what is and what is not shared so that can jeopardize the quality. So, okay, I'm done. Those, the, those are my slides. Here is my blog. I've, I've included some links here that, uh, that relate to what I've talked about today, the total quality framework and the in-depth interview method that you might want to take a look at. And uh, this is my, I have some references here and this is my contact information. So um, do we have questions? How did I do on time? Okay, two o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret, this is Sue. Um, so colleagues, if you have a question, uh, you can add it into the chat box and Margaret and I can uh, find them there or um, raise your hand or just jump shout out um, because we aren't able to see everyone at the same time. Okay, I'm reading a comment here. Margaret, that long comment was probably for me. Uh, huh. As you were talking about, you know, building rapport and you know all those other you know key um, factors of success, it just really yeah. reminded me of what yeah. an anthropologist once told me. And it's like, and part of that rapport and the trust yeah. that they built is they trusted enough to say, "No, you're wrong." Yeah. Which helped him actually come up with you know a much better analysis. Yeah, that's great. That's terrific. And you know, what I thought you were going to, you know, there is something in qualitative research called member checking. When the researcher during analysis actually goes back to the participants mm -hmm. and says, you know, this is what I think I'm learning or I've learned in the research. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, Steve, I, um, I'm not a big fan of that only because in the work I do anyway, I don't have the luxury of then modifying because it's it's not unusual at all for mm -hmm. the participants to say, no, you know, that's not what I meant. That's not, you know, you mm -hmm. got it all wrong. And, and <laughs> I typically don't have the luxury of going back and like re doing the whole thing. You know what I mean? So, um, so you, 
so a researcher, and we'll get the, into this when we do analysis, but has to, um, I think, take ownership of the fact and understand that that uh, qualitative data is co-created. Mm -hmm. And the researcher and the participant are, are creating this data and that at some point, then it becomes the researcher's job to um, uh, make sense of that and, and do the analysis and all. So anyway, I think I, I got off your <laughs> comment, but thank you for that comment. It really it struck me. So, uh, Margaret, there is a question from Claire in, at the end of the chat, a uh, question about in-person. Um, do you do you want to read it out loud or paraphrase it so the everyone hears it? Yes, and and Ava, thank you for the question of, for the statement on the the. I know that's your favorite slide. <laughs> I know you like that slide. Um, for in person, can you comment on having a clock in a place that both interview and interview? Oh, this is interesting. Sometimes it's awkward without that element in place, and recognized at the outset. There's a concern for running late or losing track of time when they are engrossed in conversation. You know, not everybody agrees with me on this, but you know what I think of, Claire, when I when I read this, and this is this has to do with focus group discussions, but it's the same point. When I walk into a focus group facility, it's not totally unusual to see a clock. Uh, um, in the focus group room somewhere on the wall or whatever. The very first thing I do, it's really, I put down my stuff and then the next thing I do is I, I remove the clock. Um, and the reason is, is I don't want, and this is true of, of uh, in-depth inter in -depth interviews as well. I don't want the participants to be focused on that. I want the participant to be focused on me just as I am focused on the participant. And, and I am, I, I'm really do not want the participant to, to, to see this clock here, um, how, or, or to see something that, or something on the table that is always on and showing the time, uh, because it just highlights the fact like, oh, okay, gee, we only have 10 more minutes of this interview or gee, I, I need to be somewhere else in five minutes, you know, and uh, and it just interrupts the entire flow and, and process of, of the interview. So I'm reading your, your comment again. Sometimes it's awkward without the element in place and recognize at the outset, there's a concern for running late or losing track of time when they are engrossed in conversation. Yeah, and I, I just wanna, this is Claire, I just wanna say that um, when I was doing some interviews, the second person, when it happened, that's when I started saying, oh, and we have a clock here, just, um, you know, and saying it at the beginning, because uh, they, as they were talking um, otherwise, they were saying, do you know what time it is? I, I hate to interrupt. And they just stopped everything to tell me that they had a class because when they really got into answering things, they totally had no concept of what time it was. Which is yeah. great. I think that's great. <laughs> Margaret, if I could follow up, because I, I think Claire has, for me, has raised um, another Another thought, and as I was listening to the two of you chat, so what as an as the interviewer, uh, what are your strategies that you use to make sure that you stay on time? Because uh, if you've asked someone to, you know, will you give me an hour of your time or 90 minutes of your time to have a conversation or a discussion? I want to honor that. So, what are the strategies you use to keep yourself on time and ensure that the colleague you're interviewing is able to leave at the appropriate Right. At, what, at the time you promised. Yeah, I do. It, so, so this is going to sound contradictory. Um, but so when I'm doing an in-person interview, I will actually um, wear a real watch. You know, those old fashioned things you put on your, your wrist. And um, what I will do is uh, as we are having conversation, I will 
uh, hopefully very discreetly um, look down at my watch. And um, I will usually pull up. So before we start the interview, I'll actually pull up my sleeves a little bit, depending on what I'm wearing, so that my watch is always exposed. Now that may sound contradictory, but it's, uh, but it, but I don't, but I don't think it is. It's, it's one thing to have this clock that's sitting on a wall or is mounted on the table next to you or something of that nature, which is just screaming the time all the time, uh, which I think is very disruptive, and and really is is missing the point of of what we need to be focusing on. But when I when I am wearing a watch, it's just almost like even though these days it's like it's a little bit odd, but there are people who wear these wristwatches, and and it's almost like just a piece of jewelry or something. And I as and I as I mentioned, I'm always taking notes. Um, I take lots of notes, and uh, I as as I'm taking notes, I'm just you know blah 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 blah, and my eyes are going over into my watch just to make sure that I know that I'm on track uh, uh, on, on time and where I am in the guide and where I am with, with the interview. And to the point where I will say, if, um, if we only have, let's say 10 or 15 minutes left of the interview time, and this is a particularly interesting informative participant, and I know, and we're not, we're not as far along in the guide as we should be, maybe, because this participant's so informative. Um, I will even just say, I'll do like a little timeout, and I will say to the inner the participant, I say, listen, you know, I I just noticed that we have you know ten minutes left during our time slot. Uh, you have just been a wealth of information and I just really enjoyed talking to you. Could, um, do you think we could extend our time here a little bit for the interview? And if not, maybe maybe you could return or I could come back and interview a little bit more at another time. So I'm, I'm getting that permission up front. So then we can now put that behind us. We've had that conversation. We've had that conversation about time. We know what's gonna happen. We know that 10 minutes are gonna go by and either this person is gonna give me another 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is, or I'm gonna come back at another time and, and we're gonna finish the interview. We can put that away and now we can continue having our conversation. Um, so I don't know if that answered Sue, your comment or not? Did that? It did. Thank you. I I, I tend to wear a watch myself all the time. Uh, Good. So that was that was what I was thinking, but I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were. Yeah. Um, so, and, uh, colleagues, we. Oh, go I'm ahead. just going to say we have a, a couple minutes left. If there's one last question anyone has, um, and if not, we will we can bring our session to a close. But. Let me give you a chance to ask one last question if anyone has one. Please don't hesitate to contact me about any of this. Um, well, we're going to be doing this again on Thursday, of course. Um, but if there's anything else you want to follow up on, just let me know. I think um, Sue has provided you links to my calendar for office hours, and we could talk that way or whatever. So just let me know. Thank you, Margaret. Well, I don't see any more questions. Uh, okay. So colleagues, thank you again for joining us today. If, uh, if you know of some colleagues that weren't able to join today and were maybe on the fence for Thursday session, um, please encourage them to join. It's the same login information or let me know and we can make sure everyone has um, the link. As I noted at the beginning, we will share the recordings and materials, et cetera, uh, after Thursday's presentation. Um, so thank you. And uh, yes, do reach out to Margaret with questions um, and any other further comments. Um, so with that, Margaret, I'll give you the last word if there's anything you wanted to add to, to say goodbye. Um, 
just uh, thank you all for um, for being here. It's good to see all of your profile images and all. <laughs> and and um, again, don't be don't be afraid to to reach out if need be. Happy to discuss any of this further if you like. So thanks again. All right. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye now. Okay.